Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We're starting our weekend day off right with watches, and everything is for sale. Please reach out to me directly. I am your best authority if you've got questions about these watches or questions about pricing. I can also get you extra photos, notes about boxes, papers, accessories, and additional details of condition and history. If you want to sell us a watch or trade a watch, guess what? We buy what we sell. We sell what we buy. We will pay unlimited money for your collection. We have no upper limit on value paid. If you've got watches to sell, we can pay cash, we pay fast, we make it easy. And if you want to trade a watch, we can often give you a higher value for trade than an outright sale. To buy, sell, or trade, reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com for pricing. A lot of folks remember that in 1969, Omega launched its first ever Speedmaster limited edition. Well, in 2019, it revisited the famed BA145022. Now, 1,014 examples of the original were made so appropriately in moonshine gold. Omega created 1,014 examples of the re-edition, but this is far finer than the watch offered to Richard Nixon and the Apollo astronauts. By the way, Nixon was unable to accept the gift of the Speedmaster. He did the right thing, and he made sure that it went to other government authorities. How did he get that right, but not Watergate? I digress. This is an incredible watch, and it's a lot more impressive than the original. First, it's a sapphire sandwich, sapphire crystals on both sides. Second, Ceragold, gold bonded with a burgundy red ceramic bezel. Also, I'm going to move the hands a little bit so you can see this more clearly. The dial itself is now made of solid moonshine gold, meaning the dial is a disc of solid gold that's been dished, snailed, and vertically satinated. We've got vintage Omega logos on the dial, on the crown, and also on the clasp. We have onyx across the center of the hands as well as on the indices. And then we have moonshine gold itself which is 18 karat yellow gold that also includes silver, copper, and palladium. So it will retain its color over time. We have a simulated vintage link bracelet, but make no mistake, you can see removable links fixed by screws. This is modern construction. So too is the twin trigger release clasp with thick gauge moonshine gold. And then the watch has a feature that for a long time was never included on moon watches hacking seconds. All this possible because of the new moon watch caliber, the 3861. A lot has changed. It's yellow gold gilded in this edition. You can see that there's a chapter ring around the edge. On one side, you have a piece of lunar meteorite, and then on the other side, you have this cropped circle that represents the Earth. If you were to extrapolate these curves and draw out the circle implied by this cropping, you would have a circle that allowed the watch to represent the true relative proportions of the Earth and the Moon. So if you were to extrapolate these two circles, you would wind up with perfectly proportioned Earth and Moon likenesses. You can also see a metalized impression of the American region from which the Apollo 11 astronauts launched. That's the landmass you're actually looking at. You're looking roughly at the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the movement itself is manual wind, 50 hours of power reserve. It's now coaxial. It's a master chronometer. It's free sprung. It has a silicon hairspring. It's effectively amagnetic to over 15,000 gauss. It's still a cam lateral clutch chronograph, and it's still Lemania based. So a lot of the most important moon watch elements are retained. It's just more attractive to look at, and now being a master chronometer, far more durable, resilient, and accurate. Previously, chronometer certified moon watches were extremely uncommon. Throw it on the wrist, it's still a 42 millimeter moon watch. It's actually only 13.3 millimeters thick, so fairly thin by moon watch standards. And it's only 47.5 millimeters from lug to lug. Without solid end links, this wears much shorter across the wrist than a standard Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch. You can really see it's coming nowhere near the edge of my wrist. Down the barrel, that's particularly evident. So this will wear on a wrist as small as 14 centimeters in circumference. The first Glasuta Original, Senator Perpetual, launched in 1999, and then it was updated regularly with the big change coming in 2005 with the addition of the High Horology Twin Mainspring Barrel Caliber 100, and that's the watch we have here, and you know it's the 2005 and not, for example, the 2006, because this Guilloche Sunray dial was only made for one year, 2005. It became a smooth dial the next year, so you know exactly when this was made. It's durable, it's 
wearable. It's 40 millimeters. It's well loomed for a dress watch. And being a steel dress watch, it's fairly robust. So this is one to wear every day. You can see that the links are countersunk to create a very tight tolerance bracelet that has extremely little side-to-side -side play. We have a single fold trigger actuated deployment clasp. You can see inside the clasp, there is a rack and a lock. And by pushing the logo, you unlock approximately one centimeter of adjustability with one millimeter increments. So that's nice for fine tuning the size. The dial includes that lovely rosette pattern and then sunray guilloche adjacent to the moon phase. There is a fascinating system in this watch for zeroing out the seconds hand. It works like a flyback chronograph. Once you set the time, you press this lower trigger under my thumb and it zero resets the seconds hand. We have a double digit date. We have an aperture style perpetual calendar, which is what I prefer. You can see that the leap year phase indicator, which changes color during the leap year, is located just below the logo. And then when we look on the back, you can see why I call caliber 100 high horology. A beautiful looking movement. This is caliber 100 02, the 02 variant. Twin barrels, black polished swan's neck fun adjustment mechanism, 55 hour power reserve. We have black polished ratchet wheels, a beautifully solarized reduction wheel, hand finished to create that look adjacent to the winding rotor. The two barrels ensure a very even torque release from max wind to minimum wind so it doesn't suffer a big drop off of balance amplitude after 18, 24, 36 hours. And all this is adjusted in five positions the way a chronometer would be. Chronometer and high horology adjustment standard is five positions positions. That's the gold standard, really. Six position is very uncommon. So this is five, and that's pretty much as good as it gets. That's what you get on a Vacheron, for example, or a COSC chronometer. The watch being only 40 millimeters is smaller than the later Senator Perpetual, so it wears quite nicely. A handsome and versatile watch on a full bracelet, it'll fit a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. Now I've got some fun stuff for you. I have not one, but two white gold Ulysse Nardin freaks. Let's go by historical chronology. The first freak came out in 2001, and while it was a watershed watch for Ulysse Nardin and the industry, it didn't work that well, not initially. So, four years later, what's sometimes called the Freak 2 debuted, the Freak, 28,800 vibrations per hour. So this is 4 hertz. The original was 3 hertz. This also uses the dual Ulysse escapement, which is more reliable than the original watch's dual direct. It's 44.5 millimeters in diameter in white gold with a few yellow, or I should say pale gold garnishings. Uh, it's really a very pink type of gold. It looks yellow to the eye, but it's, it's a very light pink. And then we have a number plate on the side, satinated and fixed by blued bolts, the way a uh, Ulysse Norden marine chronometer would have been in the 19th or early 20th century. When you lift the lock at the base, this was one of the other changes made on the Freak 28.8. This unlocks the bezel, which is used to set the watch. People always ask me, I, you know, what time is it? I can't read the time. It's the easiest thing on earth. Do you see numerals on the dial? Do you see a minute hand and an hour hand? It's 10.30. Now... It's 10.45. Now, it's 11 o'clock. It's very easy to read. It's a revolutionary watch, and not just because of the use of silicon for a double impulse, unlubricated escapement, not just for the use of silicon for an anti-magnetic hairspring, but also because it uses a carousel that's also a baguette movement as the minute hand. Let's unlock it one more time. When you push the lock down, it prevents movement of the bezel. On the original Freak, that was a problem. But when you unlock it now, you can see I'm able to move this. How am I doing this without crashing the escapement? It's because this is a carousel, not a tourbillon. A carousel has a different power source for the escapement and also for the rotation of the carousel itself. So... I am not putting any extra forces forward or backwards through the escapement when I move it. And you can see it's free sprung for durability with a recessed bolt variable inertia balance. It's also beautifully finished. As you can see, there's beveling on the edge of the bridges. There's Cote de Genève across the top. There is a sunburst metallic blue base with blued screws on the 
baguette movement, and then we have a second sapphire inside on which metallized deposited numerals are located, and that's how you read the watch precisely. Now, the watch is not water resistant. It's like a minute repeater. Moisture and dust resistance only, and I'll show you why. Let me know when you can see it. Now you can see why. The upper pivot of the carousel projects through the sapphire. So because of that through fitting, the watch is considered to be non-water resistant. And up until 2013, that was the case for every freak. Now, not only is this watch set using the bezel, it's wound using the case back. So by turning the case back, I wind the seven day power reserve. You could see inside a coiling mainspring, Carol Forestier Casapi, the watchmaker who was for a long time in charge of Cartier watchmaking at the high end, she created this idea of having an enormous full width mainspring that would propel a movement in the center. And she actually won a watchmaking award for this during the 90s. That idea in combination with the carousel and the silicon double direct impulse escapement became the 2001 freak. And so she, Ludwig Oxlin, Pierre Gigax, and of course, Rolf Schneider, the sponsor, all became the fathers and mothers of the original Freak. Now, taking a quick look at the other Freak, this is the Freak Lab. Again, Pierre Gigax for a long time was the technical director of Ulysse Nardin, often tasked with taking Ludwig Oxlund's ideas and engineering them into final solutions. Now, what we've got here is an example of that kind of engineering. This is called the Freak Lab because it debuts a relatively new concept called Yuli Shock. We have a shock protection spring entirely of Ulysse Norden's own fabrication. And if you know the industry, you know that some of the toughest parts to fabricate are assortment. So escapement, hairspring, balance, but also shock protection and silicon. And Ulysse Norden makes all of this. It makes its own silicon through its Sigatech subsidiary. It's probably the smallest company in the industry that can make silicon. It also makes its escapement both the lever and the wheels, and it makes the hairspring, which is silicon and anti-magnetic. You could see that the baguette movement now, in that we have every part of the movement except the power source, which is on the back of the case, the baguette movement has been pared away. And I would even go on so far as to say that the beveling and the detailing of this bridge has improved quite a bit compared to the original Freak and the Freak 2. This was a watch that came out in 2015, and it became the first Freak with Yuli shock, but also the first Freak with a date. And I'm not sure if it's actually just passed through midnight. We still have the locking system here. But what typically happens is that in order to operate the date quick set on this watch, you sweep through midnight and then you advance. And you can see how that drives the date backwards. So that's how you advance the date. And eventually, when you get to the date turnover, you can ratchet back and forth and advance it in a ratcheting fashion. So click, click, click. And that's how the date is set. It's an unconventional quick set, but that is how it works. Now we have a couple of nautical elements here. First, there is the use of Ulysse Norden's signature anchors for the minute and the hour hand. There's a teak deck-like platform at the base of the dial, a waveform that has been cut into the bezel, and you'll see the same on the reverse side. You'll also see that the case back features an inset disc of Ulysse Norden's signature silicon and carbon fiber. The rest of the watch is white gold and 45 millimeters, so bigger than the Freak we just saw by a small margin, although it is considerably thicker. This one's only about 12 millimeters thick. This one's more like 14 and a half. I'll throw it on the wrist. This one also has the seven-day manual wind power reserve. It has water resistance, not a lot, but 30 meters. The central pivot of the carousel no longer projects through the sapphire. And you can see that I can wear it, but if my wrist were any smaller, I would have some issues. I'll also wear the original Freak 28.8, just so you get a sense of how it wears. It's almost as broad, but quite a bit flatter on the wrist. I would say this wears broader across the wrist, but flatter, whereas this might actually be a little bit more compact across the wrist, but it is thicker and it's undoubtedly heavier. Taking a quick look at the reverse side, 
you could see the use of white gold, carbon fiber, and silicon all in one. And this watch has something the other freak does not, which is luminescence. So while it doesn't give you a lot of information about the time, it does give you some. If you're going to own a Ulysse Norden, I advise that you own one of the GMT plus minus perpetuals, the freak, or perhaps one of the automaton minute repeaters. That's pretty much it. If you want to own an iconic Ulysse Norden, those are the ones. If you want to own the most important watch, wristwatch of the 21st century to date, you want either a first or a second generation freak. It just created so many different new threads of watchmaking. I have a bit of a fondness for Orphan brands. The problem with Orphan brands is that when a brand is discontinued, it can be difficult to source parts and service. The nice thing about the discontinued and short-lived Pierre Kunz brand is that it is part of the Watchland empire, which was Franck Muller's extended universe, including European Watch Company, Pierre Kunz, Custos, Rodolphe, and Martin Braun. And the nice thing about Pierre Kunz watch is if you need anything for them, up to and including a Pierre Kunz branded strap, you can still get it through Franck Muller. Pierre Kunz was a watchmaker born in 1959 who was primarily, like most watchmakers, responsible for working at other companies. He didn't create watches under his own name. He was a complication specialist and gradually worked his way through the industry, acquiring an impressive reputation before joining Watchland in 1998. In 2002, They'd seen enough of him to offer him his own brand within the Franck Muller Extended Universe, and in 2002, Pierre Kunz was born. Now, the brand was discontinued before the end of the 2010s, but during its time, it had a reputation as a retrograde display and high complication specialist, and the retrogrades in particular were what defined a Pierre Kunz watch. This, launched in 2008, 44 millimeters in diameter in steel, is the Pierre Kuhn's Grand Dot Sport. So it is a sports watch, being both shock resistant for a retrograde and 100 meters water resistant. It's fairly thin, just over 12 millimeters thick, and it features a combination of a texalium dial with a retrograding seconds display that jumps every 30 seconds. Impressively, for a watch with a power intensive double digit date and a retrograde, it is chronometer certified. The base is a chronometer grade ETA 2892A2, automatic winding, hacking seconds, quick set date, 42 hour power reserve. The module is Pierre Kunz, so you get the retrograding system and the big date. Now, Mike Michaels and I, years ago, took apart a Pierre Kunz watch. The base caliber was admirable, it was a chronometer grade ETA, but the module was breathtaking. I mean, the way it was finished and built, it felt Vacheron, Patek, Audemars Piguet level. It was gorgeous. And the only shame is that you don't get to see it. But rest assured, it is absolutely the real deal. If you gain psychic satisfaction, like you would from a mid-century Geneva Hallmark dress watch, from knowing there's something beautiful in your watch, you'll love this. Now, there's plenty of loom, even in places where you might not expect it. Some people ask, why did they put the name on the hands? Well, because it's fun in the dark to have a fully loomed name brand hands. And you can see how the retrograde is also loomed. It's a barrel of monkeys on the wrist. The dial is made of a material called texalium, which is fiberglass that has been coated with blue aluminum. So while it looks like it might be carbon fiber, it's actually a weave of glass fiber that has been bonded to blue aluminum. You can see everything on the dial is applied Features like the hands, the scales, the guilloche rayon, and the Pierre Kunz nameplate. These are beautifully hand-finished elements. And again, on a rubber strap with 100 meter water resistance, automatic winding, a deployant clasp, and plenty of loom. This is a real sports watch and a legitimate one. I could wear this quite happily. I love this thing to pieces. And it was an expensive watch in its day. When it came out in 2008, it was $12,800. That's a lot of money. I've seen them priced, depending on the dial, strap, and clasp, 12300 to 12800 And that's in 2008 money, not inflation-adjusted dollars. Today, that's going to be well over fifteen grand. This is an impressively made watch. And provided you've got the wrist for it, I can't see any reason you wouldn't want to add this to a collection of oddball, unusual, and orphan brand watches. There's something 
wonderfully romantic about a lost cause, especially when a name like Pierre Kunz was behind it and you can still get service and parts. Alango Unzona is always fun and always a highlight in any episode that features one, but a lot of folks decry the thickness of Longo watches and I'm with you. The problem with the landmark dotograph is that it's thick for its diameter, whereas with the 1815, both first and second generation, it's got all of the case back features of the dotograph, all of them, everything. The difference between this and a dotto is on the dial side with the power reserve and the date. So on the case back, they're identical and the 1815 is much, much thinner. Rose gold, sterling silver dial, blued hands. We have a pulsometer scale outboard and a nicely dished dial with wonderful depth. We have a flyback chronograph, just like the dotograph, 39.5 millimeters in diameter in rose gold, 18K beat rate, free sprung, overcoil hairspring, column wheel, lateral clutch, manual wind, and you can see the size of that balance, absolutely enormous. It does feature a hacking or stop seconds function, should you desire. And you can see the quality of the finish just on the steel parts. Everything that turns black as I tilt this watch has been mirror finished and finished up likely with either diamond paste or a zinc block. Very difficult to do. Golden hued German silver bridges and plates with the copper and the German silver alloy giving it that golden hue. The beveling on both steel parts and German silver parts parts, beautifully hand wrought. This has none of the usual evidence of engine filing that you'll see on, say, an FP Journe, a JLC, or an Audemars Piguet. This looks genuinely hand finished. Column wheel feel is among the best in the industry. And you can see that we have blued screws, but also black polished screws. Why settle for one when you can have both? Pivot jewels set in golden chaton a la pocket watches. And this East German made watch is redolent of German watchmaking finishing standards and elements that are incredibly difficult to achieve. Take a look at the clutch for the chronograph. Do you see that there are sharp inward angles rendered in steel in incredibly tight recesses? It's tough to do inward angles on German silver or brass. To do it on steel with outward points and inward angles, super challenging. Throw it on the wrist, it's just a better fit than the dotograph. I'm all about the 1815. And the 1815s with blued hands and pulsometer scales, so first generation 04 to 08, or even probably my favorite. You can see how low this is. It fits underneath the cuff as a dress watch should. A fantastic sports chronograph with flyback capability, romantic detailing, and the quirky but lovable doctor's scale or pulsation scale for judging the pulse of the patient. Here's an oddity. The original b -er, or Baubachtung's Ur, an observation watch created for the Luftwaffe in 1940, self-evidently a timepiece used by the Germans in World War II. That watch was reborn as the big pilot's watch in 2002. This is a big pilot's watch, but guess what? It pays tribute for, to a plane famous for fighting the Germans in the Battle of Britain in 1940. So we have a little bit of a tension in this big pilot's watch, big date, Silver Spitfire. The Silver Spitfire was a restoration and circumnavigation project by IWC that they launched in 2018. The idea was to restore a supermarine Spitfire with its famed Merlin engine and elliptical wings, fly it around the world, do so with IWC watches, and then commemorate it with this 2020 model year limited edition of 500 pieces. So. We have the image of the B-Ur of 1940, and on the back, the literal airplane fighting the people who wore that watch in that year. Okay, polemic over. It's a bit odd, but then again, our watch collecting hobby has always represented tension between what we know to be fiscally prudent and what our heart wants. So perhaps it's more natural than I think. Plenty of loom in this 46.2 millimeter bronze watch. Aud well, here's the thing. Automatic in most cases. The 50,000 series here is manual wind. What do you gain? We well, gain a thinner case, the romance of manual wind, 
and one extra day of power reserve. So whereas a standard 52,000 series would have a rotor winder and a seven day power reserve, the 59,000 series, which is used here, has a case back power reserve indicator and eight full days. Free sprung, five position adjustment, overcoil hairspring, two barrels. It adopts the twin barrel layout of the 52,000 series automatic. So finally, we no longer have to worry about the fast running and slow running problems of these big automatic IWC calibers. When first conceived as the reference 5000 and later in the 50000 and 51000 series, they had a tendency to run really fast when fully wound and really slow after a couple of days. With the twin barrels and phased mainsprings, that's no longer a problem. You can see the bronze begins to patinate almost immediately. And this watch is quite resilient, although the outside will weather and change with time. It is 60 meters water resistant with a screw down crack so on a different strap, it is swimmable. It has blowout protection, so if you're in an aircraft cabin that suddenly and explosively loses pressure, you won't blow out the sapphires on the watch, nor will you compromise the case seals. And finally, there's a soft iron cage around the movement to protect it from magnetism. You can see we've got both a hacking or stop seconds function when you pull the crown out all the way, and we have a quick set system for the flush mounted big date discs. So there's a lot to love here in this Swiss made watch from the east, the northeast, Schaffhausen, where this is made, is German Swiss, founded by an American in German speaking Switzerland. IWC has always been a little bit different. And this watch is emblematic of that olive green military inspired dial, rose gold broadsword hands, titanium case back, and bronze case with a matching bronze buckle and an elaborate, riveted, and stitched alligator, well, excuse me, calfskin strap. This is calfskin because it's aviation. I'm actually jumping ahead to the air. watch I'm looking at out of the corner of my eye, which sure enough does include alligator, <laughs> but this watch is all about its dial. This is the Parmigiani Florier Pantograph oval. So the Pantograph, inspired by a late 18th century Varden and Stedman British pocket watch that was restored by Michel Parmigiani in 1997. What we have here is quite literally a Pantograph or a device that follows a contour. These are used to keep street cars and light rail in contact with their overhead power supply. They're also used to trace patterns for reproduction on a template. So a pantograph is used in the creation of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Tapisserie Dial series. Here we have a pantograph that traces the arc of this oval shaped white lacquered dial. And you could see it is an absolute riot to watch in action, unlike anything else I've ever seen. Now, there was a concept watch for the Oval Pantograph back in 2011. The production version came out in 2013, and this rose gold model with the white lacquered dial with blue printing came out in 2016. It's uh, an odd watch, 38 millimeters wide, and then 12.9 millimeters thick, and then from lug tip to lug tip, about 52 millimeters, so fairly broad across the wrist. The lugs are welded on, so this is an exquisitely handcrafted case, and we have a date that includes a quick set at the base of the dial, and we have a power reserve at the top of the dial that traces the eight days of power reserve. On the reverse side, we have a movement that will bring tears to your eyes. This is the PF-111, developed in the late 90s. It features eight days of power reserve, gorgeous hand finishing, and elements that you won't find even on many Geneva Hallmark watches. For example, look at how many interior angles we have where bevels meet in a sharp inward cleft crease. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Are you impressed? I am. That's one of the most difficult feats in watch finishing, the interior angle. And here, they're just blowing us away with their capability. Parmigiani, through its subsidiary company, is making every part of the watch, except for the strap, which is provided by one of their stakeholders, Hermes. As a result, the strap is buttery and supple, feeling broken in even when it is completely new. The stripes are beautiful. You can see they have a darkness gray 
gradient from side to side, not being stamped, but laid down by a brace of wheel. You could see we have black polished screws with chamfered slots and circumference, and all of the screw and jewel sinks have been internally beveled for a partridge eye effect, with satination and internal beveling on the wheels, and micro perlage across the base plate with a black polished swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism, and chronometer style five position adjustment, a watch that defies the use of superlatives. It speaks for itself, and its wrist presence with a cambered and curved case back is second to none. What a machine. If you love these watches, reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.